I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. More than 1.3 million people are sick and more than 76,000 have died. So some make comparisons to the apocalypse and experts say every time there's a calamity, that is exactly what happens. The scenes unfolding before us have some believing we are approaching the end of times. According to Google Trends, there has been a huge spike in searches about the apocalypse in the United States in the last week. It's not just the COVID-19 pandemic. Some folks are pointing to other recent events of, shall we say, biblical proportions. Volcanic eruptions in New Zealand. No, 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 no. A plague of locusts in East Africa. And epic wildfires in Australia that really did look like hell on earth. Are all these signs of a biblical prophecy that the apocalypse is close at hand? That's what some folks believe. I'm not scared of the apocalypse or things like that because I know in the end what's going to happen. Shemaine Webster is a devout Christian. She believes the COVID-19 pandemic is a message from God. I have a lot of faith in God's plans and his purposes. But Columbia University religion professor Ari Goldman says the end of the world is about as real as the zombie apocalypse show The Walking Dead. He points out that talk of the apocalypse frequently comes up during worldwide crises. Some of our worst fears and worst predictions um, um, sort of occupy us and take over our rational thinking. Recently, there has been a tremendous increase in mockers and scoffers that are attacking Christianity and the Bible in general. On two occasions, the Bible warns that the closer the coming of the Lord Jesus, the greater the mockers and scoffers will become. Second Peter 3, 3, and 4. Knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Jude 1, 17 and 18. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time, who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. What is so significant in both 2 Peter 3 and Jude is, the prophets and apostles warned about mockers and scoffers. Apparently, the mockers and scoffers are a sure indicator we are living in the last days. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope. I'm Dave Reagan, founder and senior evangelist for Lamb and Lion Ministries. And uh, I wanted to just share a few thoughts with you today about what I call God warning. God never pours out His wrath without warning, and He does it in two ways. He does it first by sending prophetic voices to call people to repentance. And then if they do not repent, he begins to put remedial judgments upon the nation to call them again to repentance. God is so patient. He's so long suffering. He does not wish that any should perish, but all be come to repentance. So what we're seeing, I think, in the world right now is God putting a remedial judgment upon all the world. We have many signs in the Bible that point to when Jesus is going to come. We have signs like uh, signs of nature, signs of society, spiritual signs, technological signs, signs of world politics, signs of Israel. And all of those are converging for the first time ever, clearly indicating that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. And as we look around the world today and we see things like wildfires in Australia and uh, locust invasions in Africa and this pandemic all over the world and volcanoes erupting and earthquakes occurring, we can see that the signs are converging, all of them for the first time ever. It's as if God is shouting from the heavens, Jesus is coming soon. I believe that this pandemic is 
a worldwide remedial judgment that God is using to call people to repentance, to get them to think about eternity, to get them to think about their lives and where they're going to be when they're no longer here. I hope you are giving serious thought to your eternal destiny. And I hope that if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you will do so today because He is your only hope. The Bible says that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. So if you've never accepted Jesus and you don't know the peace that Christians can have in the midst of this kind of chaos, I urge you, pray to the Lord. Father, I'm a sinner. I admit I'm a sinner. I admit that I need salvation. I come to you in repentance. I receive your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then when you've prayed that prayer, find a church where you can begin to hear Jesus preached and you can begin to study the Bible and you can publicly proclaim your faith in Jesus in both a public proclamation and in water baptism. Just uh, follow the E. Some directed traffic. Back up, back up, back up, back up. And you're good. Others lined up each car just right as members of 12 Virginia churches rolled up with their masks on and maintaining strict social distancing guidelines to send the world an Easter message. In the middle of this pandemic, there's hope, that there's strength, and that we will make it through this. Because he has risen, so will we. On a stretch of road in Chesapeake, dozens of cars lined up to spell the words, He is risen. I think with as much desperation and anxiety going on in the world at this time, people are looking for hope. And it's a great opportunity for us to get out there and love our neighbors and share the love of Jesus with them. As the emotional and physical toll of the COVID-19 outbreak rises, folks here want their fellow Americans not to lose heart. God is with us. Oh that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is with us in this really terrible time. Pastor Bob Fox organized the event to encourage congregations to reach a hurting world during times of uncertainty. This is an opportunity for us to go forward, not just to be passive and just try to wait it out, but to really listen to the Lord. The Lord wants to use this time to take the church to, to new levels of expressing the gospel. And it's happening. Research shows a huge spike in online searches relating to faith, God, and the Bible since the viral outbreak started. We've seen big upticks in searches around fear and anxiety. We've also seen record levels of people sharing scripture. Fox says while this event is a symbolic gesture of unity. And also just to get out, take the gospel outside the walls. Since we can't get in the walls, we have to take it outside the walls. As the coronavirus pandemic continues to bear down across the globe, the drivers of these 49 cars are hoping that the words, He is risen, will bring hope in the midst of this historic season of fear, anxiety, and widespread isolation. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. The Lord Jesus foretold that there would be plagues or pestilences in various places in the last days before he returns, as we read in Luke 21.11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. The definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. These things are happening in various places around the world, just as the Lord said they would. The toll on American families in this country, workers on the front lines risking their lives, from the hospitals, of course, to the supermarkets, to the male men and women, and with at least 10 million Americans out of work applying for unemployment, the long lines tonight for food. As we reported last night here, the new numbers also show the terrible toll on African Americans. Minorities are being hit especially hard. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami tonight. 
Outside this Miami area unemployment office is more proof tonight that COVID-19 is ruining families. More than 10 million Americans are out of work and that number will rise. There was very little social distancing here Tuesday. They were more worried about how they're going to feed their children. We had a, a glut of people show up way too early. We've given out hundreds and hundreds of applications but now we're printing up hundreds and hundreds more. It's no wonder that 80% of Americans feel things will only get worse. At this food pantry in Fort Lauderdale, the lines were even longer. Right now I haven't worked in two weeks, both jobs had to put on hiatus. We saw lines just as long as people waited for food near Pittsburgh on Monday. It is with heavy heart tonight that the family of Cheryl Catron shares that COVID-19 robbed them of their sister on Friday night. She worked at a police station in suburban Atlanta. In Detroit, hearts are breaking for the family of Vincent Barber. He and his wife Latresa were just married in October. She thinks he got sick after a haircut. I'm watching people who are not taking this seriously. They're partying, they're visiting everybody, and I lost the love of my life because he wanted to go get a haircut. Authorities across the country are now underlining that black and brown Americans have more to fear from both the virus and the shutdown meant to fight it. And tonight, new numbers. Experts share that only one in five Latino workers can safely work from home. And the CDC tonight is saying that while black Americans make up 18% of the U.S. population, they were 33% of all coronavirus hospitalizations in the month of March. We've known literally forever that diseases like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and asthma are disproportionately afflicting the minority populations, particularly the African Americans. At those food pantries across the country, the lines are filled with hope and thanks. This is very good, awesome, good. Each box, a small bit of rescue. And Steve Osinsami with us tonight from CDC headquarters in Atlanta. And Steve, you hear from so many of those families how grateful they are for this food. And we really need to support our food banks during all of this. But, of course, we have to remind our audience that those families, many of them, still wait for those all-important stimulus checks. Those checks can't come fast enough, David. And the Treasury is saying that Americans waiting for a stimulus check by direct deposit will see those checks hit their bank accounts starting next week. But if you're waiting for a check in the mail, it could take at least a month or so. Police are apologizing to a man who was arrested while tossing a ball in a park with his six-year-old daughter. The man who was arrested says he and his daughter were at least 15 feet away from anyone else. This caught on tape shows a dad being taken into custody in front of his wife and six-year-old daughter. His crime? They were taking a break from quarantine and were tossing a ball around in a park in Brighton, Colorado. They're like, you know, if you don't give us your information, you don't identify yourself, then we're going to place you in handcuffs. We're going to take you down, process you and book you. They're like, we're going to do it in front of your daughter. A citizen posted the video to social media. The dad taken into custody turns out to be a former Colorado State trooper. Mooney notes that none of the officers putting him in cuffs wore gloves or masks. Mooney says he sat in the patrol car for 10 minutes before officers released him without a citation. He says the ordeal really affected his daughter. Were you scared? Were you nervous when your dad was talking to the police officers? I was scared and angry. The department is apologizing, calling it overreach by our police officers. The death toll in the UK continues to surge, with figures just released confirming that 828 people have died in England alone in the past 24 hours from coronavirus. Nearly 56,000 people have been infected across the country, among them Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who remains in intensive care. Boris Johnson was given supplementary oxygen. Cabinet ministers say he's in a stable condition and is in good spirits. Despite the new death toll in the epicenter of this pandemic, a glimmer of hope. There's no doubt that we are now bending the curve. The bad news isn't just bad. The bad news is uh, actually terrible. New York setting another one-day death toll record, 779 people. And the governor saying that number will rise as more patients struggling in the hospital lose their fight. The longer you are on a ventilator, the less likely you will come off the ventilator. But this morning, the infection rate appears to be slowing in New York. Some hospitals now releasing more patients than they're admitting. An encouraging sign for the physically and emotionally exhausted health care workers. 
my mom in the hospital in Brooklyn, bringing ABC News into a makeshift ICU. Dr. Daniel Nicola was seen ripping off his mask and walking away from our cameras after calling a patient's family to update them on their loved one's condition. I mean, one of the parts of our job is delivering bad news to patients. Honestly, it's one of the more psychologically exhausting parts of the job. So telling someone that their family member may not make it, it really does, it takes a lot. As New York shows signs of flattening the curve, other potential hotspots are being closely watched, including the Washington, D.C. metro area, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. And we're triangulating testing data with the attack rates, with the hospitalization, with the number of cases, and really creating a mosaic of who needs what when to ensure that every American is served well. A leading model now predicts 60,000 Americans will die in the pandemic by August. That's down significantly from the 100 to 240,000 it predicted just weeks ago. Doctors credit social distancing and saying we can't let up. What you do with data will always outstrip a model. You redo your models depending upon your data. And our data is telling us that mitigation is working. So again, as Dr. Berg said, keep your foot on the accelerator because that's what's going to get us through this. But as Americans wonder when life will get back to normal, a sobering message from one expert. We're not going to get back to normal, the sort of before COVID, the BC kind of normal where we go traveling, we go to restaurants, we go to concerts, we go to religious services, we go on cruises until we have a vaccine that protects everyone. That's 18 months. It's not going to be sooner. In the meantime, there's new hope for a potential coronavirus treatment now in the works. It's a pill that blocks the coronavirus from attaching to lung cells in test tubes. It could be used to both treat and prevent COVID-19, and it is set to start clinical trials in humans this spring. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. The coronavirus pandemic is not only straining resources in our hospitals, but also on our streets, where police are trying to make sure everyone is following the stay-at-home order. Then add to that, last night, 19 shootings, six of them homicides. CBS2 investigator Megan Hickey has been digging into the most recent crime data and the impact on our city. Particularly during the last week, overall crime was down, but shootings and robberies were up. CBD superintendent says it's taking away resources that they should be using to fight COVID-19. <laughs> Toothbrushes, deodorant, toilet paper. They're being packed into Ziploc bags and passed out on the street in West Garfield Park. The Institute for Nonviolence Chicago hopes providing these essentials will encourage residents to stay at home. Not everyone is eating it, so many young people are not. But they, in one ear out the other. Tenny Gross and Shelby Brown spent yesterday evening responding to shootings. But yesterday was a horrific night. The violence is not going down as much as it should. Six people were killed in shootings across the city, following a trend from last week. According to data analyzed by the CBS2 investigators, shootings were up 42% from the same week last year, from 28 shootings to 40. So we're fighting the pandemic and we're fighting the epidemic. The epidemic is being violent. CPD data shows that last week robberies were on the rise too. Meanwhile, today, the area near Madison and Costner was bustling. <laughs> Groups gathering on the sidewalk business as usual. Tenny Gross says drug trafficking appears to be thriving despite the stay at home mandate. You don't become cured out of your addiction just because now there's a virus. And when there is addiction and demand, that means there will be a supply as well. 
So now they're focusing their efforts into a full-fledged public health campaign. So we know what's up and we need everyone to act on that. Interim Superintendent Beck said that CPD dispersed 300 groups last night all over the city. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. We're following several developing stories now. Four people shot, one fatally, a child among the four hit, but that child will be okay. It happened this evening near 86th and Damon in Gresham. Police say someone drove by, open fire, aiming at a house. We're told some victims self-transported, including the child. Someone took the child to Little Company of Mary Hospital. Oh my gosh. We're just, you know, it's not enough to have the virus. We have to have crazy people shooting too, so we were scared. Police say an armed man who fired a flare gun outside of the emergency department at Orange Coast Medical Center today was stopped by hospital staff. This is exclusive video of the suspect who, according to officers, threatened to kill people inside. The suspect is seen walking over to the ER and saying something along the lines that he's going to go in and shoot the shoot up the hospital. Uh, at that point, the security guard who sees this goes inside, notifies the people working inside that what's going on. At that point, some uh, employees of the hospital go out and they actually subdue the subject. This patient was on the sixth floor of the medical center in Fountain Valley getting chemotherapy as the crisis unfolded. They just came in really quick, locked all the doors and told us that there was a situation. As FBI agents, along with police, investigated the threat, staff shared how health care workers and patients locked themselves in closets and hid as a code silver or active shooter message was shared throughout the hospital. It's crazy. Our staff here, especially the emergency, is going through so much already, and it, it's, it's a lot of stress. Around 1130 this morning, witnesses called police to report that a gunman was firing off yeah. rounds in front of the emergency room. Officers say they seized a flare gun and a replica handgun. So if he went into the hospital and shot that off, what could happen? It could, it could kill somebody. Police have now identified the suspect as Christopher Thomas Ray. They have arrested him on suspicion of making criminal threats and illegal discharge of a firearm. According to officers, Ray's girlfriend was in this hospital. Also developing a man pushed to his death into the path of an incoming train. It happened at the Jackson Red Line around 5 p.m. during what would normally be the height of rush hour. Police say the man was on the platform when three other men pushed him onto the tracks. He died at the scene. So far, no motive. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5-13. through Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 
and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. Some wild spring weather around the area last night left a major mess in the north suburbs, and now some homeowners are facing repairs and a big cleanup. CBS 2's Mugo Odigwe is live in Evanston with a look at the damage. Mugo. Yeah, good morning, Aaron Hale. That's what some people here in Evanston saw last night. We're talking massive rocks just all over the area. You can see and hear the noise from the hail falling in Evanston. We're talking large hailstone, hailstones here. Take a look at this picture. It shows you how big the chunks of hail was. As you can imagine, it left some damage behind. Look at this video from our nonstop news crews. Several cars were damaged from the hail last night. You can see back windshields on some of those cars just completely gone. Then there's this damage at the Auto Barn Evanston. Several cars in the parking lot now have shattered windows and windshields. One homeowner describes the damage the hail left behind. The hail was big, like some were as big as a baseball. Um, golf ball was like the smallest I saw. It damaged a lot of cars, uh, totaled my car, front, back, the upstairs um, window. The good news is no injuries were reported, but some repairs will be needed today. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is... Any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. John 15:18 through 20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Well, lots of debate over abortion in the midst of this current crisis. In Texas, a federal appeals court said yesterday the state can ban most abortions while under an emergency order that limits non-essential surgeries. Four other states are now considering similar bans. Also, there's debate over who can gather in front of abortion clinics. In several cities, police have clamped, clamped down on pro-life activists who are offering prayer outside abortion facilities. And last Saturday in Charlotte, North Carolina, police arrested local pro-life leader David Benham. Police say 50 people were congregating outside a facility violating the county stay-at-home order. Benham denies that and says just three people, just three sidewalk counselors were outside. Here's a look at Benham talking with police as he was arrested. We wouldn't be doing this if we were not acting we, under the advice of our attorney. We, we have, I know you're acting under the advice right. of your attorney. We have the authority we to be here. We did not feel like we had firm legal standing. I understand. Not be doing this. I understand, and I appreciate your service. Okay, I really do. So that's why all these police officers are I here. I understand. We, we're prepared. I'm very thankful. For this, and, and we, you know, if you want to make this, draw this line in the sand. No, it's not me drawing the line in the sand. We Who are a recognized it? charity. Who is it? We are a recognized charity, and you it? know this. Mm. Well, joining us now is David Benham from Charlotte, North Carolina. David, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Wendy. 
Well, police say there were 50, 50 people congregating outside the clinic. I didn't see that. And it, no. they say it violated the North Carolina stay-at-home order. They arrested you and seven other people, but you say you weren't violating the order. Why? Yeah, there's several things going on here, uh, Wendy. There was not 50 people. That's just insane that they would even say that. I I'm really saddened to even hear that. Um, but what we did as a, as a pro-life ministry, by the way, we were not gathering, we were not congregating because, I mean, we're in a global pandemic right now. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves, and we need to submit to these COVID-19 laws. Now, with COVID-19 in North Carolina, the state statute says that only essential businesses can be open. And, five, and by the way, abortion uh, facilities are essential businesses in North Carolina. And uh, federally recognized 501c3 public charities are also essential. As a matter of fact, in the ordinance or in the statute, it says they're strongly encouraged to continue operations. So what we did with Cities for Life, which is our pro-life organization, we pared down our sidewalk counselors. We only had three of them out there. We even made sure they stayed socially distant, though we didn't have to because we're still essential. But we wanted to go above board. It's talking, not touching, hand sanitizer. And yet I get a call Saturday morning. There are a lot of police here threatening arrests. So I showed up and they said, sir, you can't be here no more than 10 people. And of course, I went through everything I just explained to you and they they placed me under arrest. First time ever. Did you spend any time in jail? <laughs> Four hours <laughs> I was there. And, and like I said, I'd never been arrested before. Probably the hardest thing for me, uh, you know, just kind of on the light side was they weighed me and I haven't been weighed since the quarantine. <laughs> I had gained six pounds. So, you know, I was like, what? <laughs> Definitely not worth being arrested for that. Well, okay. Senator Ted Cruz has spotlighted your arrest and said that social distancing must not be used to silence pro-life views. Is, is that what you see happening basically in Charlotte? Yeah. That's exactly what's happening here. And because if you go just a, a, a quarter mile down the road from the abortion uh, facility in Charlotte, there's Home Depot. It's open. There was a thousand people there Saturday morning. You go down the road to Bearden Park in the heart of uptown Charlotte, and it was packed. Hundreds of people were there. No arrests. There have been 1,400 COVID complaints and only eight arrests. And those arrests we're in front of the local abortion clinic. So it's viewpoint discrimination. And by the way, those eight people that were arrested, all of that was after I had already been taken away and they weren't even congregating or gathering. They were way more than 10 feet apart. It was, I mean, what's happening right now is we're seeing that Governor Cooper in North Carolina and our mayor and governors across the country, if they do not like conservative voices or pro-life voices, they're using this COVID emergency as, a, as an opportunity to grasp and silence our voices. So we've got a constitutional issue on our hands and we really have to stand against it. Well, David, uh, how are you and your family doing? I know you've got several kids, your wife. How are you guys handling this lockdown? Oh, we're handling it, I, I guess, okay. I mean, today was kind of tough. We, I've got some teenage kids, so we're dealing with, uh, you know, hey, are you going to be a giver or a taker and attitude things. So we're getting through it. You know, we, we homeschooled for years, so we're back to homeschooling again. And I've got my company, my brother, I've got a twin brother. He and I uh, are training and working with entrepreneurs uh, through VenomBrothers.com, trying to work through this COVID crisis. So, you know, we're, we're just getting along. But, you know, the people that really are suffering more than even the folks that are suffering with COVID are the unborn children. And they deserve a voice. And if abortion is going to be essential and they're going to pack women into those waiting rooms, then we should have the right to be socially distanced, offering services outside those facilities. Amen. Well, you and your brother and your whole family, you guys are always a light in the darkness and even more right now during this coronavirus. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. 
The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.